Hello, good evening and welcome. It is Monday the 5th of August, it is 10pm and it is The Late Show and I'm so glad to be with you tonight. Mark the cabbie, Mark Willits, uh, is here with his lovely son. There he is. Evening, Jack. Good evening. All Dad. right, mate. <laughs> <laughs> how bizarre is that? We were, we were praying on the way here, just laughing, thinking how amazing God is really, just what an absolute privilege it is to talk about the things of God and the ways of God uh, with your son. And uh, I can't believe it, I'm bowled over. So enjoy the next hour. It will fly, as usual, very, very quickly. We're going to go quite deep tonight. Uh, not going to have much of the Mark the Cabbie joviality tonight. Um, we're going to go quite deep. So remember, it is an interactive show. So do uh, email us in and text us in 07781 47 28 47, I think. Ooh, brain's gone blank. That never happens to Mark the Cabbie. Um, uh, live at revelationtv.com, I hope. That should be it. If, you, if not, someone's going to get a message asking about sanctification because that tonight, Jack, is our... Is that title, isn't it? We're mm -hmm. going to go deep on sanctification. A lot of churchianity these days, uh, modern churchianity, is very surface, is very seeker-friendly, very socially upbuilding, and a lot of it, in my opinion, has diverted a long way from the real depths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you, I, I said to you, you can come up with a title of the show, um, and he's come up with a great one. Jack? Talk to us about sanctification and uh, just basically what you want to talk about tonight. Well, yeah, sanctification has been on my mind for quite a few months. I think it, I was in Germany around November, December, and I'd listened to a sermon by our pastor online, and I was so convicted, and it was the passage in 2 Peter chapter 1 where it says, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And I just thought to myself, I've really got the order wrong there, because my whole life it's... Add, for me, it's been add to your faith, knowledge. And I thought to myself, well, I could debate Calvinism and Arminianism till the cows come home or the timing of the rapture. I could give you every verse for that. But am I making progress in my life as a Christian? Am I becoming holier? And I thought, yes, but I'd like to do that quicker. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you fancied a bit of drive-through sanctification? <laughs> <laughs> there are no shortcuts. No, there's not. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's been on my heart for some time now. And it's important to remember, salvation is past, present and future. So we've been justified, if we're Christians, if we're born again and know Christ. We're being sanctified and we will be glorified. And the Bible does also mention a couple of times how we've been sanctified. Because, you know, when you are in Christ, you're set apart unto God. But in general, the Bible talks about being sanctified. And that is the Christian life. But before that, you're justified, which means you're made right with God. And how do you do that? You simply accept the gift of salvation. It's a free gift. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You just receive it by faith in the, in the blood of Christ. And then after that, you have the Christian life, yeah. where we, we now belong to God, and we want to honour him, become holier, get rid of sin from our lives, and uh, get deeper with him. And that sanctification, that, that really means to be set apart um, and, and to be made holy as well. Yeah. So you, you could also say holiness is the topic for the evening. And there was a scripture that both of us really like, John 17, 17, which says, Sanctify them in the truth, your word is truth. And that sounds quite foreign to me because I've just bought a new Bible, an ESV, and I'm used to the new King James, which is pretty much the same, but even just the old preposition change, it seems bizarre. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Um, and so here it emphasises the word. Um, so sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. So the word is vital in the path of sanctification. So I wanted to look at five ways of interacting with the word. Because um, some people just think, oh, you just read the word. Um, but there's more to it than that. But that is the first um, option, uh, Bible reading. And... Um, I was thinking to myself the other day, you know, how many chapters should we read a day? And it just occurred to me, a programme on TV is normally about 30 minutes. Yep. And you can easily get in from work or school and watch six programmes. Easy. And I was thinking if we just watch, instead of watching one programme for 30 minutes, we could read the Bible instead. And if you're being very generous, five minutes for a chapter, some are just two or three, 
You could easily read six chapters a day. That's just half an hour. Um, but you don't want to be legalistic about it. Yeah. I remember when I was about 16, I did the Bible in a year, and it was really a year and a month, and I couldn't tell you most of what happened. I was just reading through it, trying to do my <laughs> Bible in a year. We've all been there, man. And um, <laughs> didn't get much from it. So yeah. um, Bible reading is the first thing. And recently, I was at a Christian week away for young adults, Bible and prayer. And one of my friends got up to give a quick testimony. Uh, my friend Rabsy, we call him. Yeah. His real name's Peter. And uh, in fact, he's coming round soon, so I'm looking forward to seeing you, Rabsy, <laughs> if you're watching. <laughs> and he mentioned how he got in from church and he felt really ill. And if that was me, I would just watch a film. Um, but he said he put on the audio Bible. And I was really convicted by that. I've never used an audio Bible in my life. And I thought, I'll just download the audio Bible. It's free if you get it from an app store. Yeah. And uh, that counts Bible reading or listening to the Bible. So that's the first point. Um, second point is memorising. Yeah. Um, I don't, do you do Bible memorising intentionally? Not intentionally. It, um, by the grace of God, I've got a bit of a photographic memory going on. So yeah. I, I, it normally just sticks there. And, and normally the, the rule is if it interests me, it sticks. Yeah. So if you're halfway through Second Chronicles and you haven't got a clue what's going on, or, or Lamentations, um, it probably doesn't stick so much. Yeah. But give me a book of the Book of Romans or Book of John, and because it's full on for me, it normally sticks. So, uh, yeah. but it is good to try and intentionally memorise. Well, we always laugh because we've got such different memories. Because <laughs> you memorise absolute nonsense, like number plates from 30 years ago. <laughs> And for me, if I read politics or theology or philosophy, it just tends to stay in. Yeah. But I really struggle with just writing down a verse and just trying to repeat it loads or write it loads. Yeah. It just doesn't stick in for me. No. Um, so for me, what I find is if I write a theological essay just in my own time about any topic I'm interested in, the verses I use in that tend to stick in. Um, but for you at home, I can't say do this or do that because it's whatever works best for you. But it's really useful to have memorised scriptures because it's like when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness by the devil, and the devil would quote scripture, mm. and Jesus would quote it back. That was his weapon. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a very useful weapon. That was number two. That's number two. Number three is listening. Yep. And that can be a sermon on a Sunday. So even if you regularly watch Revelation TV, it's still brilliant to go to church on a Sunday and listen to a sermon. And the Bible does say, don't forsake the meeting together, and it's in Hebrew somewhere? Uh, yep. Um, as some are in the manner of doing, so make sure you're regularly listening to sermons. And me personally also, I like to listen to sermons online, whether it's David Paulson, who's often on Rev TV, I think. Yep, he is, yeah. Uh, David Wilkerson, yep. Martin Lloyd-Jones. Yep. got another friend visiting this um, Sunday. Um, well, actually, I think Wednesday's coming over. My friend Julian from Germany, who some of you will remember, uh, we call him Jules and he does the best impression of Martin Lloyd-Jones. <laughs> I won't even try, because I'm useless. No, nor will I. <laughs> but if you want a really good pr preacher to listen to, who's yeah. got an interesting voice, Martin Lloyd... I'm so tempted to do it, but I just <laughs> Don't, won't. do so. not. <laughs> I'll embarrass you myself. You do the jokes to me, you do the theology. Um, <laughs> Jack, can I just interject there? Go for it. You're, you're a bit like your old man, aren't you? You've, you, you like the Puritans, you like the old guys, you know, the ones that have gone on now to glory. Um, you like your John Flavels and your, your Samuel Rutherfords and your Lewises, you know, I know Lewises, aren't you? Hundred, you know, a few years ago, a few decades ago. Um, you like the, the Wesleys. Sometimes I think you were born in the wrong century because you really should be walking around on a horse you know, with a bag of apples on your back. Yeah. You know, um, yeah, where did I get you from, Jack? What, what is going on there? I do often think I'd love to have lived 100 years ago where you don't have technology and you can just focus on spiritual things and you've not got temptation everywhere. Um, but we, I think we're in a privileged position to say that because yeah. <laughs> Christians have had it so hard over the centuries, and even just normal people with poverty. Um, but may, I'd, I'd like a year off, maybe in the 1910s. That would yeah. be nice. Um, yeah. But yeah, I love, I love the people who have been tried and tested. Yes. So as I said, Martin Lloyd Jones, David Paulson, David Wilkerson, I love. Yeah. Um, you, and your favourite, and you've just read his biography. Leonard Ravenhill. Read Leonard Ravenhill, 600 yeah. and odd pages in about five days, wasn't it? Yeah. Wow. And I was cracking up recently. I gave the book to my dad to read. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd been away at a conference for five days. How many pages? 56 or something? I got through 54 pages in five days. So he's reading about 11 pages a day. I thought, you've got all this spare time, and that's how you've used it. But uh, whatever you want, I can't say. You're my dad. <laughs> uh, but Leonard Ravenhill, I absolutely love. 
Yeah. And there's hey. some... Leonard Ravel was an, on a different level of yeah. everything, wasn't he? He, he yeah. was... He, he wouldn't fit in today, would he? You know, because he really had a call of the spirit to prayer, uh, a meditation of the word, you know. He, he really was deep, wasn't he? Yeah. And that's another reason why holiness and sanctification are on my mind, because reading his biography, he... It's not a biography where it just says, oh, you should do this, you should do that. Yeah. But it just gives his life, and you see his life was a life of prayer and holiness, and it just really inspires you, and I thought, I want to be more like that. Um, yeah. That, that's my aim. Yeah. Um, Before you get on to your next point, Jack, I just want to clear up um, just a couple of things about justification and sanctification. Let me make it clear. Are you saying that we are positionally sanctified but we're also walking out a life of sanctification, so we're being sanctified, aren't we? So positionally, we're absolutely sanctified in the Lord, but we're yeah. walking it out, aren't we? It's exactly that, yeah. In our position, in our status, we've already been sanctified once and for all, but experientially how we live, you know, that takes time. Yeah, and that takes a lifetime, doesn't it? Exactly, and they call it progressive sanctification, because yeah. it happens steadily over time, and sometimes for bad periods and then good periods, but the aim for the Christian is to consistently become holier. Yeah. But justification is only in the past. Love that one. And that was a big debate in the Protestant Reformation because Catholics believe that justification is a process. Yep. That, so throughout your life you need faith, uh, you need good works, and when you sin, um, well, there's different kinds of sins, but you need to do penance, and then you've got the sacraments, I think they have seven sacraments. Right. And then by the end of your life, you still might not be fully justified, so you, need, you might need to spend 50,000 years in purgatory. Yeah. And reading the Bible, you think, how on earth can that be true, you know? Yeah. Um, Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Yeah. It's completely done, the work at the cross. Justification is once and for all. Wow. And our heavenly hope is that one day we'll see Jesus face to face, and whether that be when I die, or if he comes for me, I'm not going to spend 50,000 years in purgatory. No. The Bible says no. if you're saved, you are fully saved yeah. by the blood of Christ. You can't add to your justification. No. Um, and that's, that's the issue that Martin Luther had four or five hundred years ago, wasn't it? In 1500, whatever it was. Yeah. He, uh, just give us a little bit about what Martin Luther is famous for. Just for any new Christians out there, people that, you know, aren't hot on history. I'm not hot on history, but uh, yeah. what did Martin Luther get up to? What was he famous for? Well, he kicked off the Protestant Reformation, really, and he was a Catholic monk, and he started preaching through Galatians and Romans and the Psalms, and he was starting to realise so many things he's reading are in contradiction to the teaching of the Catholic Church, and he was in a predicament where he was thinking, well, should I deny the authority of the Pope and the Catholic Church and the Church Councils, or do I deny the authority of the Bible? And well, that's not hard predicament, you obviously go over the Bible, that's, that's what you embrace. Um, but in doing so, he's rejecting the other Catholic authorities. And that really brought forth the idea of sola scriptura, or scripture alone. Yeah. Where scripture alone is the foundation of knowledge of God, and doctrine, and spiritual matters. And from that came the most important point of the Reformation, which was, we are saved by faith alone. Yeah. And that is why you can be sure of your salvation, because it's not as Catholicism teaches, a justification that happens over time and maybe into purgatory. Um, if you're saved by faith, then the moment you believe, that's it. Yeah. You're in the Lamb's Book of Life, you're secure, you're predestined to glory. Um, so that was really the, the key point of the Reformation. Yeah, great stuff. And that all happened because he was so in the Word, he was reading it constantly and trying to teach it, and that's where he got these revelations. Wow. So I think the life of Martin Luther is a reminder to be stuck in the Word. Wow. Yeah. Um, so we've covered Bible reading, yep. memorising, yep. Uh, listening. What's number four? Number four is Bible study, and that's something I've really enjoyed, especially at university, where you can look into doctrines, and I try to cover a bit of everything, eschatology, the study of end times, so the rapture, the millennium, the return of Christ. Yep. That could be spiritual gifts. You're nothing like your dad, are you? <laughs> <laughs> we even dressed the same. We even dressed the same, because it's the only shirt I've got. <laughs> we say I'm the reincarnation of you. You are. But the only difference is I can't do, was it 120 squat thrusts? <laughs> in one minute. In a minute. <laughs> um, and a concordance is really useful for that. Yep. So you can just look up well, verses about spiritual gifts, and you've got a big list, yep. and you can work out yourself. 
Um, and the fifth and final point, which, which is I want the big one, isn't it? This is one I want to emphasise. This emphasize. is the one that you've really focused on for a because while. Because this is something which I think a lot of Christians forget or are just not aware of, but Bible meditation. Yeah. And that sounds very New Age or Buddhist. We're not talking about transcendental meditation where you empty your mind. Um, Bible meditation is the complete opposite. You fill your mind with scripture. But it's different to reading because in reading you might cover a few chapters. But in Bible meditation you really just dwell on, um, on one truth or one verse or a couple of verses. Yeah. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go to Romans 12. Um, is that your favourite book, Romans? I love a bit of Romans, yeah, absolutely. In Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So in order to be holy and to be a living sacrifice, we need to renew our minds. And what better way to renew our minds than Bible meditation? And especially nowadays, you know, there's filth everywhere, whether it's on the TV or advertisements in the street or the words, radio, music. The radio, music, words your friends are using. Yeah. And when you're surrounded by that, it's important to just spend time in the Word and be, let your mind be restored. Yes. Renewed. Um, so one, probably the first example of Bible meditation in the Bible is in Genesis 24, verse 63, where it says, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. And Isaac obviously wasn't a Buddhist, he was a Jew. Um, well, in fact, Judaism didn't even exist then. He, he, he was a believer in the, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He was, yeah. He was one of them guys. Absolutely. And uh, he was meditating in the field. It doesn't say what on, um, but he was meditating. And there are many other verses which tell us what we should meditate on. Yeah. Um, Joshua chapter 1. Um, a verse, fam famous verse, that, isn't it? A verse 8. It says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So, Bible meditation is essential according to Joshua, and it brings prosperity. And it was different for Joshua because he was in Israel, they were under the Mosaic Covenant, and if you obeyed the Lord and honoured the Lord, you would have material prosperity. Yep. And that doesn't apply the same way to New Testament saints. Um, but we can still prosper yeah. spiritually. And that's the most important prosperity, spiritual prosperity. It is, yeah. Do you know the Lord? Are you walking with the Lord? And are you being sanctified? And he's meditating on the law here. And he only had the law at the time. He didn't have the New Testament, of course. Yeah. Um, so he was meditating on the word. And a very famous passage in Philippians. Just getting through a few scriptures quickly here. Yeah, no worries. Um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And you're like me, we love reading the news, don't we? Yeah. And whatever new source you're reading, it's probably depressing. <laughs> Most of the time it is, yeah. And some things you read about and you think, that is just atrocious. Yeah. And if that's all you read and all you dwell on, you're going to be a miserable person. Yeah. And you're not going to be full of the joy of the Lord. But this says, think about all things that are good. And for me, the easiest way to do that, reading the Gospels. Yeah. The only good man that ever lived, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And any, anywhere in the Bible, all scripture is profitable for teaching. Um, so that's essential. And just one more book I'm going to turn to, the yep. Psalms. Um, I shall go to Psalm chapter 1, very well-known passage, where it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. So like Joshua, we're being told here that it's great to meditate on the law, 
And for us now, we have the whole of scripture, yeah. the whole canon. Um, so we see here that meditation is a biblical thing. Yeah. It's not a new age thing or something uh, I've just thought of. In fact, I was, I was taught this by someone else, so it's not even just us. Yeah. Um, but it's essential. And finally, Psalm 119, a few verses. In verse 11, one of my favourite verses, says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Love that one. That is the key to sanctification, to holiness, to not sinning, is to have the word of God within us. Yeah. And that comes primarily through Bible meditation, really dwelling on what the word has to say. And in verse 27, it says, make me understand the way of your precepts and I will meditate on your wondrous works. And that's an easy one to do, especially if you don't know the Bible that well. When you're in bed and you're just shutting your eyes and going to sleep, just meditate on the works of God. Yeah. Whether that's in the Bible, how he worked through Israel or through the New Testament saints, or just in your own life. We all have testimonies. We can all think of all the times God got us through, God was good to us. He really showed us his grace and was patient with us and just meditate on, on God's wondrous works. Wow. And the very, actually, two more verses. Yeah. Verse 97 says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And we've had a few, few verses here that talk about meditating day and night, yep. all the day. Yeah. And it's something you don't want to just have 10 minutes in the morning, then shut it away. You want to be reminding yourself. Yeah. And obviously, it's physically impossible to yeah. spend every, <laughs> every moment of the day thinking about the Bible. Yeah. Um, but it's something we should constantly be doing. And the final verse, still in Psalm 119, it's verse 148, which says, My eyes are awake before the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promise. And um, I think it's different in the New King James. Um, it might be goodness or, or word even. Okay. Um, but whatever it is, we can meditate on God's promises to yes. us. His promises are sure. Yeah. And his word is sure as well. So whatever the translation, Amen. Bible meditation is key. But I just wanted to really go through some verses there because if you've not heard of Bible meditation before, um, you can see now it's a biblical thing to do. Yeah. And there are more verses about meditation. Um, but meditation is different to Bible reading because meditate really means to dwell on. Yeah. And so, so you can literally, Jack, because <clears throat> with me, I, I, like, I like to just get info in. You know, um, I, this, I'm still very new to this, but you can literally take one or two verses, can't you, and spend 10 or 15 minutes just asking the Lord to quicken your spirit with any truths for you out of one or two verses. One word might leap out, one phrase, you know, and it might just quicken your spirit, quicken it by your inner man, and it will really feed you on it. So it's literally take a couple of verses, maybe even one verse, spend mm -hmm. quite a few minutes on it, and just, just live on it for a, uh, mm -hmm. a few minutes, isn't it? It's exactly that, and one pastor I know gave the idea of it being like food or a fine wine. You know, you put it in your mouth and you swish it around and you dwell on it and think, oh, that is good. So an example would be, go to my favourite chapter in the Bible, Psalm 23, verse 1. Yeah. If you want to meditate on that, so it's, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And you don't want to empty your mind and just say, Lord, fill me. You know, this is something active you're doing. Yeah. And you think, what does it mean that the Lord is my shepherd? And really, the rest of the chapter would explain that. Yeah. Um, but you think, he guides me. No. Um, he keeps me from wolves. Yeah. He protects me. He provides me food and water. Yeah. And you might think of other passages about shepherds yeah. in the Bible. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Mm. He's highlighting his divinity in the Old Testament. The Lord is my shepherd in the New Testament. Jesus is the good shepherd because Jesus is God. And I think about what does it mean that, you know, I lack nothing or I shall not want. And you might think, well, hang on a minute, there are things I need. I want to finish my degree. I want a house. I want a car. Yeah. But really, as a Christian, you have everything you need. Because if I'm in complete poverty, if I get thrown out... Um, you already have every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Exactly. And they are true spiritual blessings, aren't they? Yeah. So in that sense, in light of eternity, we have everything we need if we're Christians. Yeah. And then you just think along them lines, uh, see where it takes you, yeah. but do everything in an attitude of prayer, you know, say, Lord, please speak to me. I want to hear from your word. Please help me to understand it, Lord, open my eyes. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so that's Bible meditation, really. 
And let me just get it clear, Jack. We're just, I just want to make it clear to the viewers. We're not talking about um, trying to empty your mind. Once you, I know there's a lot of, um, how can we put this, new agey Christianity floating about, uh, where it's uh, mindfulness, be very wary of mindfulness, very wary of just trying to empty your mind um, and sit there and start humming. None, we're not talking about any of that, nothing whatsoever of that. So be very, very wary. This is biblical meditation, which is light years away from mindfulness and all that sort of stuff, isn't it, Jack? Mm. This is and it's a game changer for sanctification. Because if you wake up and you spend 10, 15 minutes in meditation, it's much harder to go and sin after that. Um, so yeah, I really encourage viewers, if you want to go on with sanctification, Bible meditation will really benefit you. Great. Great stuff, great stuff, Jack. Um, brilliant stuff. Just let you know, we are having a few technical problems tonight with switching the screens. So, uh, <laughs> do you know what? <laughs> the desk is actually frozen. So, um, if if it's all going wrong at home, hey, at least you can see one of us all the time, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, oh, I'm back. <laughs> great stuff, Jack. Great stuff. Let's get into a few texts and emails. They're starting to flow in beautifully. Got a lovely one here from Brenda. Hi, Jack and Mark. Wow, Jack, you're so like your dad. And uh, I am so enjoying your knowledge and insight into the subject and the Bible. I'm rubbish at memorising scripture, so I'm grateful for your tips. Love and blessings from Brenda. Bless you, Brenda. He's, uh, he's a good lad, our Jack, and uh, we're very, very proud of him. We're going to try and fix a few technical issues, so we're going to go to a little music break now. So I've no idea what we're going to play, but I'm going to sit back and enjoy it and see it in two or three minutes. Take care.
chosen me Love has called my name I've been born again Into your family Your blood flows through my veins We're back. We've had a complete furniture change, and uh, the desk is broken. We can't cut from shot to shot. Satan's on the warpath. He's not liking it, so that's a good, good sign. So Luke's had a great idea, and here we are in the middle of your screen again. Hi, Mark. Your son mentioned an audio Bible. I've heard of that before, but where do you get it from? Does it come on a CD or a memory stick? Who sells them? That's best wishes from Dave. Good question. For the modern phones, it's easy. Just go to the App Store, and you can download many different audio Bibles there. Um, if you have a very old-fashioned phone, I don't know, you can probably just Google Audio Bible. Um, if you've got access to the internet, then there's every chance you'll find one. Um, but look on the App Store if you've got a, a vaguely modern phone. That's what I'd say. Great stuff. Great stuff. Um, Janice comes out with a lovely little line, justified equals just as, it, as if I'd never sinned. Absolutely, Janice. Your transgressions are blotted out as far as the east is from the west into the deepest sea, and it is literally blotted out. The law of transgressions against us has been blotted yeah. out. And there was a song I wanted to play, but I completely forgot to ask for it. Um, but it's that, a song... about 25 songs now, so you can... <laughs> <laughs> You probably know it at home. It's the song, It Is Well With My Soul. And there's a great verse in that where it says, My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. So it is just as like, just as if you've never sinned, you know? You don't still have some sin to get rid of. You are fully justified. It was all nailed to the cross. Fantastic, fantastic. And that was uh, Horatio Spafford, who wrote that hymn uh, in the aftermath of losing virtually all of his family in a, in a sunken ship uh, from, I think it was from America to, to the UK. He lost basically all of his family. And he could still say, even after that utter disaster, that it is well with my soul. Great song, Horatio Spafford. Uh, Eva says, re-memorising Bible verses. Cut out cards, three by four inches, from Rice Krispies, etc. boxes, and keep going through your stack of written cards. Eva, great idea. I used to do that in my cab. I used to have little bits and bobs all stuck around all over the place. And uh, it really, really does sink in. Absolutely great stuff. Um, <laughs> Got Jeff here, our little comedian. Hi, Mark, love you. Love Jack to pieces. What an example to all of us, no matter what our age. Not only does he know his Bible, but he's obviously very well read. My, my, my E-I-N, I'm not sure what that one is. God bless, Jeff. This lad has actually got five books on the go at the moment. He's 25 now and he's making great progress. He's already got at least three of them coloured in. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, you are incorrigible, Jeff. You really are. You really do me in. Brilliant stuff. Hi, Jack and Mark. Could you please advise... Oh, this would be interesting, Jack. Could you please advise on secular music? I was quite surprised that some Christians go to secular pop concerts. I thought that secular music could be detrimental to our spiritual health. Blessings from Brenda. What do you reckon, Jacko? Well, when I was in the sixth form, so I was about 17 years old, the leader of my Christian union, who's my age as well, he uh, was speaking about Christian music, and at the time I listened to probably 50-50. I liked Christian music and I liked secular music. And he said, I never really listen to secular music because I just love Christian music. And I thought, well, that is so true. I actually prefer Christian music because sometimes you can listen to a Christian song and the rhythm's absolutely terrible. But the words are so good, you just have to keep listening to it. And so for me, the Bible doesn't say, oh, you can only listen to Christian music. Um, but it's to do with, with, with meditation. You want to fill your mind with good things. You know, things that are good and just and pure, as it said in Philippians. So in general, I don't listen to much non-Christian music. But I think as Christians, we have the liberty to listen to non-Christian music. You don't want to be legalistic about it. Um, but with pop concerts as well, I guess it really depends on who the artist is. Because some people, I would say, or as you would say, not on your Nelly, um, not in a million years. Um, <laughs> but other people, I, th I think it's, it's fine. But that's really part of your spiritual growth, being sanctified, and just ask the Lord. Say, Lord, if there's any music I shouldn't be listening to, 
or books or any media, Lord, please show me and please, please get rid of it. It actually reminds me of a verse I was meditating on a couple of nights ago. Why are you looking at that, Jack? I'll just say, many years ago and far earlier in my Christian walk, uh, I went with my old dad um, to see the Rolling Stones. Um, I wouldn't go there at all now, not whatsoever. I enjoyed it, but that shows the progression of sanctification, <laughs> you know? In those days, I was not walking as tightly with the Lord, but if I had a free ticket to go now, I, I just wouldn't go. So, the, the Bible's very clear, the New Testament's very clear. You are free to do all things, but not all things are profitable for you. So, just walk in the Spirit, the Lord will speak to your spirit, you'll get that check in your spirit, that conviction, when the Lord will, might, might say to you, you know, just what you're doing here, do you need to be here, do you need to be watching this? You'll get that check in your spirit. And the more you obey it, and the more you walk with the Lord on that narrow path, the more your inner man will be quickened, and, and you will start to know, you know? At the other end of things, like I did a great program with Ann Dawson quite a few uh, weeks ago, you don't want to get to the point where you're so, so heavy on, on legalism that actually you, you are no earthly good. Because, quite frankly, if you're, if you're going to escape the presence of sin, on this earth, you're not going to do it. You're not going to do it. You're going to hear blaspheming every day from all parts of the world, wherever you go. And unless you become a monk and sit in a cave and, you know, flagellate and just whip yourself and sit there looking at rocks, you aren't going to escape the sin. You're, you're, you're free from the penalty of sin in Christ, okay? You're being freed by sanctification, sanctification from the power of sin. But the only time you're going to be completely free from the presence of sin, it really is in... Is in the new heavens and the new earth, okay? So, don't beat yourself up. Walk with the Lord. See what you think he's saying do in certain situations, okay? All things are allowable, but not all things are profitable. So, just walk with, with that. Remember, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. I hope that helps. And I was meditating on a verse a couple of nights ago in Psalm 139. From verse 23, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, sometimes the Bible isn't 100% clear on whether you're allowed to do something or whether it's, it's not beneficial. But ask God, Lord, is that right? Please show me, please convict me, and please lead me in the way everlasting. Um, that's what I would do. But also, being filled with the Spirit is vital for sanctification as well. Because in the flesh we are weak and we are nothing. But when you're filled with the Spirit, you're empowered to live a holy life. And one way of being filled with the Spirit, which is always beneficial for me, is listening to Christian music. And this morning I woke up and I thought, I'm actually not feeling great. <laughs> I'm just, nothing had gone wrong. You just wake up on the wrong side of bed sometimes. And I thought, I'm going to be on Revelation TV later. I want to be in good spirits. And I want to be in the presence of the Lord. So I thought I'd put on Christian music and I listened to As the Deer Pants for the Water, my favourite Christian song. And it just changes your attitude because you're thinking of the gospel, your mind is set on things above and what Christ has done for us and what he's still doing in us and what he will do for us. Great um, stuff. Thanks, Jacko. John says, evening, I was listening to a podcast about knowledge and virtue today and the speaker said that knowledge without virtue is stagnant and pointed out that the devil has tremendous knowledge, and that's from John. True, isn't it, Jack? Yeah, the Bible says knowledge puffs up. Yeah. And I think I've been there in the past. I used to do, take part in debating society in my secondary school. Now, I didn't do many debates, but I'd be asked to do the spiritual ones about religion, etc. And it was probably an example of loads of truth, but very little grace. And you want to have truth and grace, and you don't want to just have knowledge upon knowledge upon knowledge, um, because you just get puffed up, uh, you get full of pride, and you end up not honouring the Lord in your walk. And I didn't get to a, a level where I was that bad, but if you carry on the path like that, it's not good. Yeah. Um, so you who, was it? who was it, Jack, that the Bible says came full of grace and truth? Was that John the Baptist or Jesus? I actually can't remember. Uh, it was, One of them, wasn't it? It was Jesus. Moses, was it Moses came on with law, but Jesus with grace and truth? Oh, something yeah. Something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Right, you might like this one. Rabsey in Guildford here. <laughs> Have you read your 25 chapters for today, Jack? <laughs> is that genuinely Rabsey? There he is. Oh, wow. <laughs> Brilliant. Hi, Rabsey. <laughs> um, 
I've upped it. I'm now doing 50 chapters a day. Um, <laughs> and I'm on chapter 45, so I'll do five when I get in. <laughs> if anyone's feeling really bad at home, that's a complete lie. I've done no Bible reading today, but I have done Bible meditation. Oh. Um, so, yeah. If you are feeling bad, just to catch up before the end of the night, just read Obadiah quickly, and you can say you've read a whole book, can't you? Yeah. Take about 12 email. seconds. Great stuff. Great stuff. Hi, Mark and Jack. Ah, oh, Frankie from Belfast. Always has something deep and profound. So I hope it is. It's not just a big joke. Uh, hi, Mark and Jack. May the Lord bless you both. Psalm 127, 3 to 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. Wow. But shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Keep pressing on, guys. You are two champions. And that is Brother Frankie from Belfast. Frankie, bless you. What a lovely... I love that one. And, um, well, you see me and my, my little family over the years on Christmas specials, and they're all getting old now, but I am certainly absolutely blessed. Absolutely blessed. Now I'm tempted to do a Northern Irish accent. No. But I won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go there. You can only do that with Gerard in, in church. Exactly. He does a good Northern Ireland accent. Hi, uh, Ricky. Hi, I've done everything the Gospel says in order to, to be saved but my life hasn't really changed much over 25 years. Am I truly saved if there is little fruit? And if I'm not saved, what shall I do to be saved? Thanks from Ricky. I don't yeah. want to drop you in the deep end there, Jack. What do you reckon on that one? That is a really good question, and that is possibly the most important question you can consider. Are you saved? Is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? On the last day, will Jesus say, enter into my kingdom, or will he say, get away from me, I never knew you, into the everlasting flames? So that is a very important question. And the Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you have genuinely come to Christ for salvation, asked for forgiveness, and you're trusting in him alone, then I, I, would, I would trust that you are saved. And the Bible does say that our fruits show our repentance, so the Christian life should bring forth fruit. But there are people in the Bible you can look at where they're not always the best example of a Christian and you might doubt, are they really saved? It's not always simple. Um, some people, you look at them and think, well, they're clearly born again, they're absolutely amazing. And one of the reasons I wanted to focus on sanctification was because I was learning so much, but I was looking at the fruit of my life and am I becoming holier? And it's not easy, so don't be discouraged. Um, but I would say, Seek the Lord, just ask the Lord, ask him to give, him, give you confirmation of your salvation. And I, th I think he will, if you really come to him with a humble and honest heart, he will respond to you. Um, and also, yeah, I think the very fact that Ricky is thinking of that and has bothered to write in, and he's quite a regular actually with us, I think that's a good sign, you know, because he's, he's, he's ruminating on this, the most important question in life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Am I saved, you know? And do you know what? Life isn't always a you know, a, a great story of fruit all the time. There are many uh, people in the Bible whose lives, if you were just counting fruit, you'd wonder what on earth was going on. You know, Joseph spent many years in prison. There wasn't much fruit bearing going on there, apparently, but what God was doing was preparing him, you know. Jeremiah, you know, cursed the day that he was born, uh, the weeping prophet. Um, he probably was wandering, wandering around thinking, why is, you know, depression and... And, and all this sort of stuff, my, my portion. There were lots of heavily burdened people in the Bible. And uh, you're not alone, Ricky, OK? You're not alone. Great question. Joel from Paul to Down says, God bless Mark and Jack, what a double act. Just wanted to share this with you that has inspired me that it's not our strength but God's that we're able to carry on what we cannot always comprehend. I love this scripture. But we, it's 2 Corinthians 4, 7 to 10. But we have this precious treasure, the good news about salvation, in unworthy earthen vessels, I think this is from the Amplified, I like a bit of the Amplified, in unworthy earthen vessels of human frailty, so that the grandeur and surpassing greatness of the power will be shown to be from God, his sufficiency, and not from ourselves. We are pressurised in every way, hedged in, but not crushed. We're perplexed, unsure of finding a way out, oh, I know how that feels, but not driven to despair, hunted down and persecuted, many Christians are, but not deserted to stand alone, struck down, but never destroyed, always carrying about the body, in, uh, the body, the dying of Jesus, so that the resurrection life of Jesus may also be shown in mm. our body. Thank you, Joel. That is great stuff. It's true, isn't it, Jack? The Christian life 
Galatians 2.20 says that we are already dead. There are a few scriptures that says you have died and your life is hidden, Colossians 3.3, 3, with, with Christ in God. So actually, um, you're actually already dead. And what you're doing, you're carrying about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ so that the resurrection power of Christ may be shown in you. There's a lot of the gospel these days is always about, you know, power and dunamis and be great and get your promotion and, and feel strong and feel fabulous and go and win 18 million people to the Lord and you're marvellous and you're great and have great self-esteem. Actually, question that. Question that. God, God can do that and put you in power as a position, etc. But that's not the be-all and end-all of it. And quite often, really, to bring you to the end of yourself so that you find God's power is the best thing that can happen to you. You know, and pers affliction, uh, persecution and affliction and heaviness are often the way of some of God's greatest saints. You know, Martin Luther, John Bunyan, John Bunyan basically had OCD to the point of utter despair and so did Martin Luther. And these two guys, you know, you, you will remember those guys' names from now until kingdom come. You know, they're, they're, and when was John Bunyan around? 1600s? Yeah, I think so. so. That's 350 years ago. Martin Luther, half a, you know, 500 odd years ago, 400 years ago. These people had trouble. These people weren't, you know, running around having the time of their lives. And even Martin Lloyd-Jones, we mentioned earlier, he suffered a lot from depression. And he was a fantastic preacher. Yeah. I didn't know that. And you often think, oh, what has he done wrong to be depressed? But it's not always your fault. Um, sometimes you just have it. Sometimes the Lord afflicts you, sometimes it's from other people. Um, if the Lord does it, it's for your own benefit. And sometimes it's even the church that can really send you into depression and make you feel low. And this is something I wanted to mention, which is that the church should represent Christ, but often it fails. And you see in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 that Jesus talks to seven different churches and five of them he speaks about very negatively. Only two of them are positive, the faithful church and the persecuted church, but five are negative. And I just really wanted to encourage anyone who's been hurt by the church, hurt by Christians, they feel abandoned, let down, discouraged, people haven't supported them or been kind to them, and you feel really broken by the church, don't let that make you lose hope in Christ. Because even if the church has completely messed up and done you wrong, God has never done you wrong, he's only done you good. And he still cares for you, he loves you, he sees you, and there's a, Fantastic verse in Psalm chapter 34, verse 18, which says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. So that's an encouragement for you. If you feel let down by the church, don't let go of God because he is faithful. And, I mean, without God, what do you have? You have absolutely nothing. Yeah. Don't um, put your trust in man, okay? We're all, we're all fallible, broken human beings. And uh, we, just because we're on this weird thing called the TV, don't put your trust in any of us, any, anything whatsoever manly. Just put your trust in God, his son, his spirit and his word. And he will not let you down because he is faithful. Jack, you're going to love this one, mate. It's from Jill. I'm so enjoying listening to Jack explaining things so clearly. I'm 86 and I'm learning a lot from him. God bless you both from Jill. All right. Brilliant. How's that, Jill? That is uh, that's such a blessing. That is, that is absolutely beautiful. Mm. Sheila. Uh, good evening, Mark and Jack. As a Catholic for 40 years, I had no assurance of my salvation until I got born again. And in that instant, I got it. Love from Sheila. You were just talking about that earlier, wasn't, yeah. wasn't you? And in the book of 1 John, John is writing and he says, I'm writing this letter that you may know that you have salvation or that you have eternal life, I think. Um, so we can know. If we are in Christ, then we are predestined to have eternal life in him. That is our destiny. It's already decided. It's not, will I go to purgatory? Will I go to hell or heaven? Our destiny is secure and God has already decided. All those who believe in his son will have everlasting life. That is our sure hope. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Christine says, great to see you, Jack. You're an inspiration. Have you read The Lives of Rhys Howells and George Muller? Uh, Mueller. I heard Howard mention Reese Howes and bought his book. It's called Reese Howes Intercessor, quite a famous one. Highly recommend them. God bless you and guide you from Christine. Do you know what? Gordon has written a great book, isn't he? Gordon, thank you so much uh, for the book that you've written. It talks about Reese Howes and uh, Hudson Taylor and George Mueller and one other guy and um, will be a good read. You know those guys, don't you, Jack? I've heard of Reese Howes. Yeah. I know George Mueller. I think there might even be a 
Revelation TV programme about him that you can get on the Revelation TV website. I think they did an, an hour-long film, something like that. But he was a real man of faith, far beyond anything I can ever imagine. Um, but I love reading about these people because it just really encourages you. I've just read about Leonard Ravenhill and I've recently bought the biography of um, Hudson Taylor. And just looking at their lives, it's just inspiring and it really encourages you to go on with the Lord. So I definitely encourage you to read, if you can, books of great men and women of God. Um, yeah, because you're not alone. People have gone before us, have fought the good fight. Now they're with the Lord and now it's over to us. He's brilliant, great stuff. You're going to like this one. This is from an old school friend, Dovid. Remember him? <laughs> yeah, I remember Dovid. Hi, Dov. Hello, lad, and Mr. Cabby Man Willits. I think you can guess who this is. Spoiler, it's Jack's school friend, <laughs> Dovid, a.k.a. Dave. All of last week, I've been learning about commitment, uh, which has connotations to sanctification, as far as I've learned in the Word of God. And as we know, sanctification is defined as being made holy, a word I'll use here more often, Isaiah 6, verse 3, if I got that correct, as well as God ordering us to be holy, just like God is holy. He does say that. Be holy like I am holy. A way of bringing us to sanctification is through the sound teaching teaching of the word and its doctrines. If the opposite occurs, poor practice of doctrine and unsound teaching, one will be unholy, unsanctified, and thus correlate to 2 Timothy 3.2, the beginning of the verse 11. I kind of forgot the rest of what I was going to say, but God bless you, Jack, and Mr. Willits. Isn't that lovely? Bless you, Dov. I'm glad you're listening. <laughs> yeah. Right. What a brilliant program. I was just thinking about all the awful things that we read about in the papers and see on TV and how the devil uses this to fill our minds to make us feel joyless and depressed, and that does happen. Well, I've decided not to let him do this to me, as I have the Lord, and he is doing and working through many people in the entire world, and great things are happening, and people are being saved. We as Christians should counteract this by promoting the love of the Lord and not let the devil beat us down and make us think that we are insignificant. Thanks so much for your program tonight. The Lord bless you, bro. From Linda. What a lovely text, Linda. Thank you. We're down to our last minute, Jack, so I need a very, very short one. Um, um, you sure there's one Jack? minute left? Yeah, there's only a minute left. I know you've enjoyed yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would say the, the final step of salvation we mentioned, we've been justified, we're being sanctified, and we will be glorified. And the Bible talks a lot about that, especially in the book of Revelation. But our hope, our sure hope, is that Christ is coming for us and one day we will see him face to face. And there are so many great scriptures, we don't have time to go through them now, but that is our heavenly hope. Our sanctification will not be complete until we see Jesus face to face, and then we'll, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. So don't lose hope. If you feel like you're really bogged down in sin, you're messing up and you're thinking, Lord, how can you still forgive me? Well, he does keep forgiving, but don't give up. He's still doing a work in you. You are his masterpiece he's doing a work in you for his glory to make you into his image so don't give up keep going with sanctification looking unto the day when christ will return for his saints great stuff jack we're down to our last 20 seconds just want to say sorry about all the technical issues these things do happen these things do happen but we got through so hopefully the uh, the furniture arrangement has worked and we've got through the show jack i want to i want to thank you for joining me jack i've loved every minute of it we will see you again in september sometime Keep looking.